there was essentially three types of cereal in World War II. Cheerios, Corn Flakes, and Quaker Oats. That was it. Okay? Uh, but by 1970, there was more than 150 breakfast cereals to choose from, uh, including ones that are very similar, like Apple Cinnamon Cheerios. Okay, by 1970s. So, ba but basically, I'm sorry, let me back up, I said this wrong. 1953 type cereals. By 1970, there were 150 cereals, but it wasn't differentiation. It was that stores had realized they could make generic versions. So they made Odeos, which were Cheerios, a different name, but they were Cheerios, and then they could just sell them, they could sell them at epsilon above marginal cost and make money. So essentially, the cereal companies were not making profits anymore because generic products had been introduced to essentially mimic what they were making. So they product differentiated. In 1989, General Mills introduced Apple Cinnamon Cheerios. It's less old than you think. Okay, it's before you guys, but uh, well after me. Apple Cinnamon Cheerios. Now, when Apple Cinnamon Cheerios came in, they were delicious, objectively, okay? And there was no good substitute. So they suddenly faced fairly inelastic demand. So they could raise prices above marginal costs. So General Mills, while getting competed to death on regular Cheerios, could suddenly have a highly profitable Apple Cinnamon Cheerio line. And they patented the Apple Cinnamon formula. So for a while, there wasn't competition. Now there's generic Apple Cinnamon Cheerios, but they weren't for the first few years. OK? So by product differentiating, they ended this death cycle of Patron competition. Is that good or bad? Let's come back to welfare. Yeah. Oh, I'm just checking your nails. Question? Uh, answer, rather. Uh, is that good or bad? Yeah. Well, is it good or bad depends very much on your model. We think it's probably good because of the principle I've talked about, reveal preference, which is if people didn't want apple cinnamon cheerios, they wouldn't buy them. So you've created a new, in product differentiating, you've created a new product that consumers want. Indeed, my colleague, very famous economist named Jerry Hausman, actually estimated that the introduction of Apple Cinnamon Cheerios raised consumer surplus by more than $75 million a year because they had this new thing they wanted. Now, on the other hand, they were paying a monopoly price for it. So we are better off in a world with Apple Cinnamon Cheerios than without it. But we're still not as good off not, a, not as well off if, they weren't, if there wasn't more competition brought in Apple Cinnamon Cheerios. So it doesn't mean, in other words, in economists, we, talk about the, we talked about the first fundamental welfare theorem, the best we can do. We also talk about the second best, which is, well, the best we can do given constraints we live under. So having Apple Cinnamon Cheerios is the best we could do. It's the second best. We are better off having Apple Cinnamon Cheerios than not. But the first best would be Apple Cinnamon Cheerios with a regulated price at the perfectly competitive price, or at least above it enough to invent new products. So indeed, today, only five firms make most cereals. Five firms. There are 5,000 types of cereal. 5,000. So that raises another interesting issue. So overall, economistic product differentiation is good. We think essentially it's driving variety. People like variety. If they didn't, they wouldn't buy it. That's good. But there's starting to be an interesting question in industrial organization of the problem of choice overload, which is in some sense, are we actually, do we have too many choices? In economics, we assume more choice is good. That's our fundamental assumption. But what if now you just get to the, you get to the supermarket, you look at that, you're like, it, I'm going to have toast. OK? Because you're like, I just can't decide. There's so much. Well, you could get to the point where we're actually worse off from that much product differentiation. 